Uh, this is our work session that is in preparation for our meeting of Tuesday the 16th. It's our, reset, our recess meeting. So uh, we have two things in order today for presentations prior to getting to the agenda itself. And we are very fortunate. Judge Quarles has remembered to be here with us this morning. <laughs> so she and Chief Ballard are going to give us an update on our curfew and our juvenile detention. And so if y'all want to flip a coin and see who goes first, you are welcome to, to do that. Or Judge, you want to just take it because that way you can go do whatever afterwards. And if you will come up here, we've got the cameras there so you can come to the end of the table there and kind of be in camera view for those of us, uh, for those on Facebook who will be watching at either now or some later date. Down, down there, I believe, is where a camera will be best for providing the update. Okay. Like this? Yeah, mm -hmm. you're good. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, allowing us to have some funding to be able to send more children to um, juvenile detention centers. It's, it's very, very helpful for us and most of the issues that I know Lynn was concerned about and I was concerned about were occurring within the city uh, because they're I always say they were, they were breaking into cars, but they weren't. They were opening the door to unlock cars and reaching in and getting guns, you know. So that was that was an issue that concerned me a lot because, you know, I, I don't think that 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds have enough sense to be walking around with a gun, you know. And, and I think they just, a lot of them have really bad judgment, as I'm sure I did at 16 and 17. Um, so I want to thank you for giving us some funding for that. And I also want to thank you, uh, especially y'all, for how wonderful the city has been doing. And, because I think that's brought a lot of stuff, not only into the city, but into the county. And it's made Octavia County big enough to have a county court, which means that December 31st, I will no longer be the youth court judge. And I'm real happy to tell you. <laughs> You lost your duties. I got lost my duties. Okay. So, uh, one of these people that's running for um, for county court will be the new youth court judge, and they have no idea what they're getting into. <laughs> but, but it's just you know it's exciting, and, and they'll learn, and, and it'll be great. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there there are some bad things I think going on with juveniles in the city and in the county but the things that concerned me the most were the fact that we have first of all we have adults who leave guns in cars and let the cars unlock but second um, these kids you know would just robe at two and three o'clock in the morning and, and would go like to an apartment complex or wherever there were a lot of cars parked and they would just you know if they, if they could open this one up they'd get the guns out and open this one if one of them was locked, they just move on to the next one. But that's tons of guns. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure the chief will tell you, you know, we, we certainly haven't caught all of them. Um, we catch some, but, but there are tons of guns out there in the hands of people who are too young and too irrational or unreasonable to have them. They, they haven't developed any sort of anger management and they just, you know, they're on go all the time and, and to me that's very frightening and one of the sheriff's deputies came to me after we had a situation where a minor had, uh, had broken a, a deputy's nose and he said, you know, I'm afraid we're going to kill one and we don't mean to, we don't want to, but I know, you know, if I see Joe Blow, Chances are he's got a gun, and if he starts reaching for something, you know, I've got to be careful, and, and that's scary. And it's scary because these officers have an idea of who may likely have a gun because they've arrested them before. So we've, we've got some gun issues with minors, and that, those are my greatest concern. So um, y'all uh, allowed me to use some of your money to get starkle folks in detention. And so, of course, these were minors, so I can't tell you anybody's name. But I can tell you that after, um, after this funding, I've sent 
um, nine juveniles to uh, to detention, and and I don't use that lightly lightly because there really has to be the reasoning has to be that society is unsafe with them walking around, and if I feel like their parents have any control. A lot of times I'll let them go to their parents and ask the parents to use some discretion, whatever. But when I think that you've got a serious threat, I just put them in for a while and hope that it works. Um, the first person I sent um, had three burglaries of occupied dwellings, one accessory after the fact to murder, and two burglaries of vehicles that resulted in weapons. And um, I sent him right after he got arrested for, um, for 10 days, uh, which actually was over the Christmas holiday. And then when he came back to have his uh, adjudication hearing, um, he was found to be a delinquent. The disposition was to go back to detention and I sent him back for 18 days. And after that, I didn't hear anything from him. Unfortunately, he turned 18, and the chief has heard something from him, but, but I didn't. So I felt like that did us a little bit of good, and I feel like that, that these kids talk among themselves, you know, and, and I always say, had you liked attention? You know, was the food good? You know, and that sort of thing. Uh, second was um, a kid that was picked up on a weapons charge, and I had had him before, uh, on weapons charges, but we hadn't had the ability to use detention as much as we do now. So I sent him to detention. He was sent for three days and then was transported to a mental health facility. Now I'll tell you that most of these kids probably need to go to a mental health facility more than they need to go to detention, but, but anyway. So he went to a mental health facility. I have not heard back from him, but I know he's back. Um, the third... Do you have uh, ages that go with these, Judge? Are we talking 15, 12, 16? Uh, uh, Obviously, can, one of them turned 18. Yeah, so. I can pretty much... Yeah, Kobe John, excuse me, this person, who's not an adult, turned 18. But anyway, um, the one that went to a mental health facility was 15. Okay. And um, the next one, number three, um, stole a vehicle, took guns out of it, and rode around for a little while. And... This was at a time when Lowndes was not taking any of our children or something. So I transported him up to Alcorn, which I hate to do because it's three hours away and whatever. But anyway, he stayed up there for like uh, 20 days. And I haven't heard from him since. So I think that did some good. Um, the fourth one was a young man who had a firearm that the last time I talked to the sheriff's office they didn't know where the firearm came from. He was driving his father's car so I had this feeling that that's where the firearm came from but I sort of like can't prove that. But he went up to someone's house and um, knocked on the door and you know and so um, he went for about five days and he came back and I've never heard from him again. He was probably 17. Um, number five um, is a young lady and uh, she was charged several times with simple assault, simple assault on a teacher, which is a felony, um, aggravated assault, probation violation, and um, this child had been troubled and the year before that her parents had signed an affidavit of commitment to get her some mental health. And then um, after she um, beat up her teacher, she's also the one that broke the sheriff's nose, but beat up the teacher. Um, I put her in detention for like about two weeks and then later she was, she was transported to a mental health facility. I haven't heard back from her. She's 16. Um, the next one was a kid who um, was in for aggravated assault with a weapon and 
he was in um, detention for about five days. Then he was later transported to a mental health facility. Then um, our next kid was 17 and he brought a weapon to school in his backpack. And if he hadn't taken it out, nobody would have known. And he didn't pull it on anybody. It was just almost like show and tell. I mean, he was like unpacking his book bag and here comes the gun. Glock. So anyway, but he went to um, to detention for about 10 days, including the Thanksgiving holiday. So sometimes when you send them over holidays, it, I think it makes, not that I try to do that, but you know, I think it maybe makes a, a more significant impression. So he was there on Thanksgiving. Um, the last one, uh, who was 16, um, brought weapons to school and he was sent there for detention for two weeks. Now, I have not had any of these people who got sent to detention come back through my court from detention. Now, admittedly, three of them have gone to mental health facilities and normally that's going to be 180 days. They usually keep them for about 180 days. So, you know, some of these haven't had time to come back to the community. But I, I feel like that it's doing good. Uh, I think the word, the word, you know, the word on the street was they won't do anything to you, you know, at youth court. Um, and we haven't done anything for a long time. We put them on probation and, you know, say they couldn't, um, they had to go to school and they couldn't drink and smoke and do drugs, that sort of thing. But that's not, um, that, that doesn't change a lifestyle because they don't do what their probation contract says. Or they, they don't not do what their probation contract says. So I feel like this has made an impression. I do not know that I mean, I'm delighted that I'm not having repeats. I'm sorry the chief is getting them, but I, I'm glad I'm not having them. Y'all are spending a lot of money, and you know that. And I don't know if you feel like this is um, this is worth it or not. I, um, I, of course, will tell you, and you would tell me, if one of these kids that I didn't send to detention shot somebody in town, then you'd say, of course it's worth it. You know, there's there's no amount of money that we could pay that would be worth saving this person who got shot by a 17 year old. But, uh, but it is a lot of money. And I want you to know that I'm very appreciative and I feel like it's doing what it meant to do. But... Um, so you that, think we're making an impression I think, mostly? I think we are. And perhaps think, changing some behavior? Yeah, and I think that and unfortunately, I think parents were always saying, well, they, they, they can't do anything to you. And now people are beginning to think, well, they can do something to you, you know? It, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to be a youth court referee and follow the law and send people to detention because youth court theoretically has no punitive um, aspects. And when you send someone to detention, it's for the sake of them, because they've been in a fight with a bunch of people and they're afraid they're gonna get back together. Or it's for the sake of the community. And there are a lot of times that I see very young, I mean very young children with guns, like 13, 14. And you, when you see these kids come in your court, you know, you can look at a 13 or 14 year old who behaves like a 17-year-old. Or you can look at a 13 or 14-year-old who behaves like a 13 or 14-year-old, you know. And to me, they don't merit as much of a threat. And when they are that young, usually their parents are much more connected and much more concerned. By the time they get to be 16 and 17, um, there's, I think there's a big gap between these kids and, and parenting skills and probably out of frustration, if anything else. So um, it's hard for me to justify, and it's, you know, my choice, and if people get healed, it's my problem, but it's hard for me to justify taking a 13 or 14 year old to detention with one gun charge, because 
I think it may have just been a fluke. And if I feel like their parents are engaged, and you can tell because both parents will be there. And you're talking to the kids and they're nodding, you know, and everything. So when that's going on, I, I try not to take the 13 or 14 year old and send them to detention. But when you get 15, 16, 17 years old, um, and you got a gun and you got a hot temper, um, it's, you know, it's something I think needs to <coughs> be taken into consideration. I, I told Lynn one time or maybe a couple of times, but I'm always amazed when uh, these kids, and most of them are boys, and you know, they're, they're real, you know, big shoddy, I mean, you know, like I'm cool, whatever. And after you tell them to go to detention, they start crying, you know? And I wanna go, what you doing that for? You know, five minutes ago, you were the king of the world, you know, but they don't wanna go. And I, I've been amazed at these really tough kids who kind of say, okay, well, we're gonna take your attention and the mama gets upset and the kid just, just boo it, you know. So I think it's making a difference. Um, I, I would frankly like to keep using it at least until I get through on the, the 31st of December. Can I tell you it's making an absolute difference? I can't. The, the chief has some punitive delinquents, I think, in the jail now. I know there, there's some at the, there are a couple at the county anyway, for sure. But I think it is beginning to make people aware that something can happen to you in youth court. And I think that when school, well, school is back, but I think as school continues and kids get sent to detention from school, it's gonna get around more because we really kind of started using it in April. So, so the short period of time, well, April, May, June, July, this is August, so five months, and you've had a nine, nine, number of nine, nine total nine that have gone to who, detention? Um, and only, we have only had like one recidivist, but that's because he turned 18. He was not my recidivist. Was just, did we ever have two? I'm sorry, I'll, did we, we ever have two at the same time? We have. We have had? Okay, yeah. all right. I think we've actually had two at the same time twice. Okay. But, and, and that's pretty much because they were... They were, you know, together. Together, yeah. Okay. They were co-conspirators. Okay. Oh, sister, I'm sorry. Um, I, I just wanted to ask. You know, when we first started talking about this, what we've done essentially is reserve beds over there, pay a discounted rate. They're available when you need them. So that's been our financial commitment. But um, I, I think one of the discussions when we were first going into this was sending children to jail, not not detention, but jail. Detention involves um, assessments and intervention programs and... Yeah, it, uh, in order to be a qualified detention center in Leon Cities, you have to have a psychologist on staff who evaluates, assesses the kids when they come in. Um, they have to have a nurse and they have to have um, uh, a... Schooling, right? Nurse, yeah, they have to have a nurse practitioner and a physician on call. They do drug testing when the kid comes in. They do school, and um, it, you know it may or may not be the best environment. It's it's a great environment because the ratio is so small, like you know maybe one to twelve, you know. But the other thing that I think is good about the schooling is that these um, teachers that are there take them as they find them, which means if you find a sixteen-year-old who can't read. They begin to teach them to read or to enhance their reading skills. So it's not so much that, you know, I'm a junior in high school, so tell me you know, what I need to know. They assess them for what they don't know and what they need to know. As far as just basic skills, uh, math, uh, you know, I don't think they worry about geometry or, you know, calculus or anything. Just, you know, like, can you balance a checkbook and, you know, can you, can you read fairly proficiently? But it's also a wonderful thing, and I've told a number of these kids, because a number of these kids are also truants, you know. And I've told them, you know, here's the thing about it. If you go to detention, you're gonna be going to school. Your mama may not think she can make you go to school, you know. But if you're in detention, you're going to school, which is good, I think. But, uh, um, what, what, what is causing them to be mentally disturbed? You got that many young people mentally disturbed. What do you think causing that? Well, my, 
immediate, and I and I don't mean to, this to be flippant, but my immediate response is, we're probably all mentally disturbed a little bit. You know what I mean? True. But functioning folks have a handle on it. I don't think these kids have had any sort of support. I don't think there's been anybody there to acknowledge the deficiency. Um, I don't think the school is in a position with you know 2,000 kids to be able to assess every kid and say this kid needs help. But I think that a lot of the kids who come through my system do need help. And I send many more kids to mental facilities than I do to detention. And I don't know what I don't know what the issue is. Um, I think in a way, um, a lot of these kids are very narcissistic. So I think everybody that's 15 is probably pretty narcissistic, you know. But I, I think that a lot of them do not live in well-functioning situations. A lot of them live with a family member that's not their mother or their father. Um, a lot of them live in big family units where, you know, when you have seven children, well, now I know, Alderman, you had a lot of children. You <laughs> took care of yours, but you know, the more children you get, the harder it gets, you know? I got eight dogs and I'm having problems, okay? <laughs> so there are a lot of these kids who come from very large families. And you gotta make an effort to be on top of all of your children, if you've got six children, if you've got 10 children. And I, I think that in a lot of cases, that's not happening. And I don't know how to fix that. I mean, I think that, I think that we have some fundamental issues, family issues in the community. And uh, they're not black issues, they're not white issues, they're family issues. And when the kids walk in, you can see it, you can tell it. And I think that lack of connection between a parent and a child is really pretty debilitating to a kid and certainly isn't sending them in the right direction. And, and that's why I think so many kids need mental health training. And unfortunately, you know, Mississippi um, has defunded mental health, you know, every year for a decade or so. So um, it's, it's really hard to get a kid into a mental health facility, but I've got great DYS workers, and uh, and they will shake the bushes to try to find a place for a kid that, that they feel needs to go. Where's the closest mental health facility? There's one in Meridian. Is there? Okay. There, there are. There's a school uh, in Octavia County that that is. It's not a mental health facility, but it's an outgrowth of a mental health facility that troubled children, and I don't mean like the ones who just, you know, are bad and, you know, have to stay after school or something, but the troubled children go to. Um, and that actually is the place where the kid assaulted the teacher. Um, but we have that in Starkville, and we have a number of kids from Starkville who go to that school. People from Lowndes go to that school, people from Clay go to that school. Uh, and there's a bus that goes around and picks everybody up. But as far as serious mental health facilities designed for you, um, funded by the state, because we've got to get, you know, we don't have that many people who have independent funding that can send their children to a, another type of institution. But Meridian is pretty much the closest we've got. We've got a couple in Jackson, we've got one in Meridian. We have one in Memphis that we use occasionally. They're, they're okay to take Mississippi residents if they have a place. And, um, and they all do, I think, a real good job, but, you know, the kids come back after six months and they're back in the same environment with the same friends and, and I don't know how that works. The young man who was um, killed Easter, probably two Easter's ago, uh, Files was his last name, F-I-L-E-S. Um, and I told you that one of these kids was an accessory after the fact to murder, and that, that involved the files problem. I had sent Cliff Files 
to mental health treatments three times, three 180 day treatments over four years. And every time he came back, he, he seemed like he was a little better. You know, he seemed like he was a little more organized and everything, but comes back to the same community, does the same thing, has the same friends, and shows up again. And, you know, ultimately he just, you know, had his daddy's gun sitting in a pickup sh tr truck, you know, waiting on some friends, and the friends came, and one of them got the gun and shot him, you know? What was that about? Who knows? I don't think the kids even know what it was about. It was just something that happened. So well, that was a long answer to your question, all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Judge. Um, so essentially now, I mean, we have it in the budget, correct, for this upcoming year. We will continue to evaluate and, and uh, you'll be here till December 31st, right. basically. Right. So, um, you know, it, yeah, we may get. A, I was going to say we may get a final report from you uh, yeah. before you pass it off to whoever the county judge will be. So we appreciate your time and appreciate you um, coming and thank giving you very us much. a brief. I appreciate it. So, all right, thank you, Chief. A little more on the same subject, sort of, kind of, sort of. Uh, Curfew. Good morning, Mayor. Vice Mayor, board members watching uh, virtually. Um, and thank you all. Thank you to uh, Judge uh, Lydia Quarles. That's uh, been a really good partner in this every step of the way. I'm going to be giving a presentation upon our all the burglaries and stolen firearms, and they're, they're an indicator of some of the stuff that we're running into juvenile crime. But I would like to add to the point from the chief of police position, we've seen a direct impact. And what we were seeing trend-wise going on with juvenile crime and again that one individual that was influencing 60 or 70 others that were watching nothing ever happened nothing ever happened therefore it was the wild wild west right when something did start to happen when an institution said we love you enough to put you into a system to save you before you become 18 and you're forever lost into the system that was a significant move and it's one that's really helped us along a uh, plethora of different issues. And uh, it's one that I think that a lot of communities that don't have alternatives are suffering from right now. But thank you, uh, each of you. And I know we had the discussion prior to me and, uh, way back when. And uh, uh, for the community leaders that came on board and said, we've got to do something. And, and one of it was taken back. We had a 13-year-old stolen firearm made the right decision to put down the gun. And those are very real events. They're not lost with busyness. I'll never forget that Easter of having to talk the mother, right? So we've seen an impact directly and um, I'm very grateful. That was one where I, I, I'm a pretty decent police officer, but I had no idea of how we were going to address the infrastructure of something that had been ignored forever and having the capabilities of doing so. So thank you all for that. Uh, let's take it over to the curfew update and where we are and what we're seeing. So we've had seven uh, educational contacts, one certified letter, and five charged uh, for the uh, curfew enforcement. This is gonna be dating from January 1st up to this time. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now I'd like to add something here on the variables. This is not not good or not what we would like to see, but this is not corrective. And I want to stress this is not absolute with juvenile crime only. That's why the numbers are where they are. What we saw was 2020 come through. A lot of, uh, again, pandemic uh, fear. A lot of weapons are on the streets. We rolled right into crime, but what happened here? A lot of media focus, a lot of discussion. Starfall was on the news. Uh, uh, too often for the wrong things and it got to be a real real focus here now what we're seeing uh, from January 1st now is obviously these numbers are going to get back up we're doing everything we can to remind the public but also you have adults now that and we've talked with the district attorney's office on this at the mayor's office here the uh, uh, several weeks ago we, we've had adults that are whether you know they're charged and those charges are dismissed or whatever for plea bargain, we have to make that more of a probationary type of approach um, because there's no deterrent from the adults that are out there doing it. 
but we still are not as successful as what we need to be in going back to the main point of locking the vehicle. Chief, the, that small print there, could you say what the, what the gray and what the red is just for yes, the... Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. I'll start in 2019 and carry it across. 2019, we had 167 uh, auto burglaries with 44 uh, stolen weapons okay. out of those auto burglaries. 2020, we had 212 uh, vehicle burglaries, and this is when we saw a lot of juveniles involved with it. Uh, 61 stolen weapons, 2021, 96 auto burglaries, 65. And you know why this, this, this number can go down, but the number's going up? People care about their stolen firearms. A lot of people are not bothering to report when their car's going through. They don't bother to call the police and say, my car's been privileged through. Many of them are embarrassed. But when they have a firearm out there, that's an expensive piece, and they really want to get that uh, track to be stolen, they want to cover themselves, you know the weapon can be used as in a burglary of an occupied dwelling, as in a murder, as in things that these weapons have been used for. Uh, so right now, uh, in 20, uh, 2022, we're holding 133 auto burglaries, 54 stolen weapons. Uh, that number has gone up since this time. I don't have it accurate, but I do know that uh, when we're coming through, we're seeing a stolen block, we're seeing a stolen this. So, we hit at 9 p.m. every night um, to lock the door. You know, we're trying every venue of social media. We have talked to every small group, large group. We've had participation with Starkville High School drama class to do educational uh, uh, videos. We've done everything we know to do to help remind people. But every year in Starkville, we get, you know, new influx of people. Uh, and uh, we have to repeat the re-education process. But, with gun ownership comes tremendous amount of responsibility, and in locking your car is a huge way. And the reason why that is, simply put, they know if they smash the window, the car alarm goes off, we're in the area, it's a high probability of being apprehended. So they know numbers-wise just to check the car. Those numbers are up, but not directly indicative of only juvenile crime. Again, because we've had a lot of adults that are being released coming through the system and not necessarily there to, to stop them on the auto burglary side. Do you, do you um, go to orientation on campus when we have that influx of new people and or send someone and talk about the importance of locking their cars at night? We, we work with Mississippi State Police Department which is that's kind of their orientation and we we are making inroads with the Greek councils to go talk to fraternities, sororities, do that kind of one-on-one -on -one vetting because there's so much information flow in general orientation, it's it's you know it's hard to get in there and retain, but it's it's much better for our open discussion. Uh, we're meeting with Mississippi State Athletics, we're meeting with a whole venue of different groups, and that that is definitely a focus this <coughs> year to get out there and to to do more than we ever have done before. I was going to piggyback on that because Maroon Alert is is too strong a use. It's like tornado and you know bad weather kind of thing. But is there something in between that is a push notification for MSU that might be a reminder that we could join with them on? And I don't know if there is or not because I don't subscribe to Maroon Alert. But I certainly am am uh, see you come through on Twitter and Facebook with the with the social media push there. But if there is either with Kristen Campanella, uh, the, you know the EMA folks, or else some sort of maroon use that we can push that out at, at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or whatever it is we want to choose to do. There may be some opportunity there that's something a little short of, you know, emergency status. Yes, so. I understand. There's so many groups and, and, and organizations on campus that yeah. should be up, uh, up under an umbrella. And it's real discussion, too. I get that marketing and recruiting uh, is important, and when you talk about lock, well, then what is the domino effect Well, we're talking about crime, this, that, for people that are not uh, necessarily law enforcement or not seeing the issues firsthand, that is a subject matter that it sometimes takes convincing. Um, In this day and age, locking your doors is not a big deal, locking doors. Right. No, I, Thank you, Judge. <laughs> It, it's not the bigger people. Everybody would be doing Well, I understand. Well, I guess that's why I say that. I just don't think it's one of those things that we should be um, ignoring as a thing to put out there. Because I don't think it does anything other than remind people that, you know, they need to lock their doors. Period. That's it. We're that's we're it. an urban environment these days. And, Mayor, when I leave here, I'll reach out to Dean Bushwell and others on campus.
this to see what we can do for the umbrella effect to help yeah. amp it up. Um, I, obviously, I'm, I'm frustrated. I love that those numbers were really, really low uh, because I know that's 54 weapons that are stolen that when we are engaging at 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, there's a very high probability, you know, that the same individuals that were stolen are the same ones we're approaching. No question that they're loaded. That's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, and I, I don't think we have anything that's, you got another slide there to make sure that it, okay, great. Um, any other? From a curfew standpoint, so the bottom line to this is we instituted a curfew. And I'm reading from this that you think it's been effective. Am I correct in that? That is correct. Yes, ma'am. I believe it's been effective. I think the combination of this and, and youth court having uh, alternatives has been a one-two dynamic that's really helped us in our juvenile. Okay, fine. Any questions of the chief while we've got him in front of us? Thank you, chief. They clearly are not having that many curfew contacts from that no, first. Not a, not a lot. So, and, and again, a small group uh, can really carry over and have impact. So um, it, it's there. We have used it, but it's not it's not at the numbers I anticipated. Okay. Um, but again, when you've got a small active numbers that are there, they can, they can run those line. numbers up a lot. Okay. I want to say previous slide chief was referencing there. What was okay. that? Those are the curfew contacts, Chief? Yes, sir. Since the curfew ordinance has been in place? Yes, sir. And educational contacts, do you find that as just uh, letting them know there is a curfew? Uh, let, <laughs> right. Yeah. Let them know uh, there is a curfew seems to be legit common sense as to what they're saying. We applied from the very beginning that we would do educational norm and enforce just like with everything, and those are educational contacts. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank Appreciate you. it. All right, um, Mr. Doherty has a presentation for us on the status of the parks annual review and, a, and some budgeting. So a very uh, important topic to follow, but I would like to add as a parks person who's running the parks and stuff, we have seen a difference in improvement with the curfew and, and reduction in some of the vandalism and the things mm. that were happening at night. And so the program that is taking place within the community, I want to say that we are seeing a difference. And we're having less issues with some of our youth. We do have a bit of a transition of age gap with some of our younger adults, but we are seeing a difference with the curfew and the things that we're doing to try to close that. So okay, well that's helpful. Thank you. I know that's part, you. not part of this, but I well, do want to say that we are we, we're seeing some positive outcomes here. Good. From that. Good. So, okay. Thank you. All right, Arts and Rec. So first of all, I'd just like to say thanks for having us here. Sports Facilities Company really appreciates being a partner with the city of Starkville and thank the officials and all the community members who make this such a great experience. Uh, the participants, our sponsors, everybody here has done a really great job of supporting us over the last year in this transition. And as that transition was difficult, uh, we have done a great job of transitioning in some areas without people even noticing. And that's only because we've had such great support from everybody. And I wanted to say thanks to not only just all the members of our city who have been helping us, but also our staff who has also been taking on that transition because our SFC staff has worked really hard to ensure that we keep that standard as high as possible during that period of time. So I just wanted to say thank you for them. Uh, next, sorry. I got the controller this time, so. Uh, <laughs> A little bit of a timeline, so in May of 21, the original three-year contract was signed, and then as we went through that, that was for Cornerstone and Sports Tourism. As we progressed through the end of that year, SFC was had an amended contract in November, so that would encompass Parks and Recreation. Parks and Recreation was kicked off in November of 21, and then in April, we did a, an amendment to the current budget at that time that was originally submitted to align it to the fiscal year so we could end through the fiscal year. As we did that, uh, we created the next year's budget, which we'll talk briefly about at the end of this, and now we're into that kind of first year completion and evaluation stuff. So we are finished with our first year of the three-year contract, and we're moving into the second year of that contract. And uh, I think at this point we're doing very well supporting the city and, and their needs and hopefully the community feels the same way. We've collected a lot of data 
in what we do to try to determine what is our success, what are we doing, how are we providing to the community. So one of the things is, is that we really will start looking at the participation numbers of our community members. As you can see in the very top right hand corner, that is total participation in 2021 that we pulled out of the new civic rec system. This is all participants in youth programming and adult programming that utilizes our facilities. We have roughly 2,200 that came out of that fiscal year. In 21-22, we're anticipating to see an increase of roughly 23 to 2,400 people. And we think the big increase is gonna be coming because we are also doing soccer this year, which is something that we haven't done in the past. We still feel though that there is opportunities out there because we're not necessarily reaching all the people that we'd like to reach. So we put a lot of focus on reaching more people in the community, getting more engaged, more involved, to try to bring some folks in. You can see that when we break it down by participation, that we have a 30% female participation rate versus a 70% male rate, which I find alarming because that to me tells me maybe we're not providing enough activities to both sides of the gender to give them equal opportunity. As we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can in the community, we're analyzing that, figuring out a way to improve that or determine why it's exactly that way. I do get questions on occasion about resident versus non-resident. And so as we evaluated that, you can see in the right-hand bar chart, non-resident, we have 205 participants that are coming as a non-Starkville address. So those are people that do not have Starkville as a address that would be considered a bit of a non-resident compared to the other 1,300 that are residents. So that wouldn't include um, tournament participation. That does not include tournament. This is strict Just rec activities. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's really interesting to see that because then we can see where people are coming in and how to kind of manage some of the outreach. Of how do we reach them and who are we actually reaching it? What I find interesting with the non with the uh, non-resident piece is that our programs are strong enough to bring people in from the community. Then we are needing to take that next step to get more members of our community engaged in our programs. So if the program is that good we need to do a better job of creating more people, more interest for those individuals. So the user side of this bar, is that the 70-30 women, men thing, or what, what's yes. that? Yes. Okay, all right, just making sure we had a pie chart and then we had a, a bar yes. thing, so thank you. Yep. Uh, the other thing that SFC prides themselves on is our hiring practices, and one of the things that we do is make sure that we try to do the best we can with the commitment to hire folks. During our transition, it was very clear that we needed to be able to take care of those folks that came out of the city and transitioned into SFC, along with the commitment to bring more jobs and more opportunity to the community. In doing so, we have brought about, at the time when this was done, we had roughly 41 individuals on our payroll that were either full-time, part-time, and or seasonal. And our goal is to get up around 51 part-time folks because we're going to need those to sustain tournaments and ball programs and weekends. Now we only use part-time labor as needed. It's not like we're just using them to have them. But we, knew, we do need to have a bit of a bench there. You can see our demographics breakdown is pretty similar to what the cities, uh, white to African American and other. And then also we are very split between male and female, which is really good. So what it tells me when I read this is, is that we're following good hiring practices to bring in the best candidates to perform so we can have great programs and be extremely safe. What's nice is we have a turnover rate of about 18%. So our goal is to stay under 20, and this includes our part-time people and our full-time people, and so does not include seasonal, because it's seasonal are only term for a certain period, but we have a turnover rate of 18%. So we're constantly analyzing how do we keep people here, what can we do to make it a good culture, a good working environment, so that way we don't get into a position where we have this gap of service and stress on our workforce. So, so seasonal is mostly like referees, lifeguards, umpires, that kind of thing, as opposed to mow mowing, landscaping versus? Yep, so um, it would be all based on how we hire them. So okay. We do have some seasonal landscape folks that come in, maintenance guys, and then we have some what we refer to as permanent part-time, which are part-time folks that we use year-round. So. I'm fascinated with your generational break. Isn't that well, interesting? Yes, and uh, 
if you look at deeper into that, out of all those folks that are under the age of 40, 80% of them are under the age of 26. It's the Gen Z folks? Uh, it's the very young, first out of your college job type of situation with most of the people that we're hiring. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because it takes a little bit longer to get them up to speed. I would, I would think you would expect more turnover to go yes. from that first to second job. Yeah, and I think that's the challenge we're going to see in the next year is how do we maintain that low level of uh, turnover by these people getting educated and growing? They want to move on, right? So. It's how do we create a situation so that they stay an extra maybe 18 months so we get a little bit more out of that investment. Are we tapping into the university's uh, um, athletic, uh, physical, you know, P PT, that's not the right word, what am I? Uh, uh, yeah, kinesiology, sports, sports management, those folks. Yes, first. and turf. So we're going okay, to be, yeah. we reached out to them and talked about some internships and getting some kids uh, to come participate here. Uh, we did put some things in the budget to help support that a little bit more and cultivate that because we get a better return on those folks and we're hoping that they would stay, work for us, and then maybe carry on to another position. So we absolutely are reaching out to them. So this year in the budget, these, these graphs uh, illustrate that if we were to fully generate the revenue that was anticipated in the budget, that would be the top line. And basically, in the left one, the green is how much revenue we've actually brought in versus the remaining balance of what we have not brought in. So you can see in the revenue slide that we anticipated to bring in a lot more revenue than we, we did. And there's a lot of factors that have gone into that. One was the November start. We had some lag with the transition and getting our feet under us. And some of it is the new food and beverage operation. It has been a bit of a transition, but we're getting there. We are there. What's the good news is when you look at the expense, it's the same thing. We also did not spend the money. So you'll also see that we didn't fully execute what we anticipated expense-wise. So the two of those balance each other out. And we manage that almost every day to make sure that we're not expensing more than we're generating to ensure that the budget stays aligned based upon what we're trying to accomplish. And in the bottom line is kind of our 10-month roll-up at the highest level. So you can see, even though that all the revenue that we brought in, we brought in about 20% of that, the variance expenses were only about 25, 30%, and then our fixed expenses were less than half of what we anticipated for the entire year. So we really work hard to manage that. So if we're not doing our part with getting it in, we're gonna make sure we manage our part of not executing it on the back end, so. And part of, part of our year this year was to anticipate that Cornerstone would have been open by now, and unfortunately, yes. you know, other things were working against us, so. And that was a, and I'll be honest, that's probably a huge, huge impact. Yeah. Uh, we're talking tens of thousands there of mm -hmm. revenue and safety expenses. Yeah. Revenue, for sure. We do have a number of projects that we're working on, so we have uh, concession stands, being remodeled at the Sportsplex, the drainage project, which is underway and which hopefully will be done by the end of this uh, year. The bridge on Sproul Industrial is a great thing. That's on, it's in progress currently. We do have a couple of capital items that we're going to be requesting, which will be a gym divider, and we're going to need to resurface the gym floor. And talk about the gym divider and what it does, because I don't think everybody might necessarily, intuitively might know, but just share with us, please. So, for instance, we have pickleball players that come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Half the court is currently used with pickleball court, uh, courts, and when they play, the balls are rolling all over the place. And so if we bring the divider in, now we can start programming to the other side that doesn't necessarily interfere with those types of programs. Another one is, is when we're dealing with youth, children, specifically under the age of 10, we want to make sure that we provide safe environments where people are not around them. And we do that by putting the divider down and creating an area specific to those toddlers. So that way we can still use the gym over here because we have a strong group of people that want to come in and do stuff. We don't want to displace anybody but what we're doing is maximizing our square footage so we get more use out of it and that's really what the gym designer will do. Okay thank you. We got Cornerstone so Cornerstone is moving along we're looking at anticipated March date for opening which will start our baseball softball league 
and all of the good things that go with that. Do you, you don't have that schedule that you, he's got, you can just kind of call it out because I was yeah. talking to somebody about it earlier today. I'll pull up the email that you sent me and I'll read it off so that we'll have an oh, idea. Oh, yes. So we have it. a lot of teams, probably about 20 that have already signed a contract with us, five roughly that are pending and a few others. Our goal is 30 at Cornerstone. Yes. And we have been very fortunate with using uh, part of SFC is, is we've leveraged that resource. We have three, four, and five day tournaments that are going to be coming in in the summertime, and that's because we've used those contacts within the organization to get them here. We have no dates open basically from March through, I think, the first of June. Yeah, that's, and that's what I've got here. I've got like uh, March the 4th, the 10th, the 17th, the 24th, the 31st, uh, April the 14th, the 21st, the 28th, May the 5th, 12th, 19th, 26th, June the 1st, 9th, 17th to July the 11th and then August the 18th and September the 8th. So we've still got some weekends that can be filled in, yep. but you've got a whole lot of activity that's going on. And that's obviously what we were designing this to do is to bring people in town yep. um, on the weekends. So that's... And it's diverse. It's a mix between baseball and softball. And yes. There's, and there's a different, there's different organizations that are coming throughout the yep. summer you got too. Grand Slam, Perfect Game, UACS. So... Triple, triple S yes. is coming in. So, yeah. and, and you've still got field availability for rec baseball and yes. softball. Yes, yep. So none of the rec baseball will be displaced by the weekend tournaments. Yep. Perfect mix. Yep, and it's been really good. The, the folks at our headquarters have been really engaged to ensure that we're getting the best uh, result for those, and they've been really good about creating those contacts for us. So. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to, no, while you were on Cornerstone, I wanted to provide that. Uh, we're always looking, so if other people hear of things, let us know. But we are looking to kind of also do additional sports tours and stuff. So. Uh, and when you say open March 23rd, that's baseball stuff, softball. Is, yeah. is it possible that you might have other activities out there Prior. before then that are not sports related? There is that possibility. Uh, you know, we just kind of put that date as our target for us, uh, just so we know how to plan ahead. But it is possible that it could get done. Uh, last week we were supposed to get some batting cages and concrete poured and we waited for a couple days in the day show so uh, and then there's other days that it goes really well so it's just kind of right now it's again back to the hit or miss and just staying on top of it on daily we have a landscape project uh, around highway 25 to the entrance uh, thanks to utilities uh, they've been helping on a project to put some lights out there. Uh, and so we really appreciate the assistance. They've been, Ed and his folks have been knocking that one out of the park. We have a Jail King bathroom project that uh, Alderman Vaughn and I have discussed. And then we have the pool. And the pool is on kind of the refurbished mode. We're putting uh, some roofs and wall and all that kind of good stuff. And as we navigate through our current system, our situation, uh, we're hoping to get to the end of that and so that we can focus more on making this really good for next year. You're talking about the wall being yes. demolished. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So, a lot of people asked me uh, about the budget related to why did the first first year's budget look so much different than our second year's budget, and with that, there were some really high level numbers that were established in that decision of what needed to be done. Now that we've been here, we've been able to go back and really dig into things to determine. How close can we get with the request of revenue and expenses and our fixed cost? In doing that, we did things like pull out all the rentals over the last year to determine what facilities are renting more or less. As an example, you can see the annex here is one of our best renters. But surprisingly to me, when I pulled the report, uh, we're not renting Jell-O King as much as we need to. So the question then becomes, how do we market that to get additional rentals? Because it is a nice bathroom in a nice location. So how do we promote that in the community so people will use it? Now, without the data, we can't take that approach. Uh, we pulled revenue, we looked at participation numbers, and then we also figured out with sports tourism, what is the financial impact if we're doing 30 events with this type of economic impact, which we're guessing is gonna be around 15 million, and what's the staffing required for that? What's the services? How much food is there gonna be involved in the concessions? 
we really break it down to try to get as close as possible so we're not being um, inefficient with our funds. And in doing that, uh, the next slide, thank you, is a bit of a comparison from what was requested the first year to what's being requested the second year. So what you can see is in the orange line is what the original budget in 21-22 was and what we're requesting in the blue line for 22-23. Overall, it's a 17% reduction. And that is because we found ways to be more efficient and found more ways to generate some revenue in areas that we didn't anticipate. So you'll see as you add up the budgets between the two years, there's gonna be about a 17% difference, lower. Also, we're currently in about a 2% variance, plus or minus, as we finalize the budget for the next fiscal year, because there's a couple things that I had noticed that we might need to talk about. But I think we're pretty close to being final. And then we do have those two capital projects. I would say that opportunities where we're not increasing payroll for those folks, we're not increasing infrastructure costs related to maintenance, because we're maintenancing things really well over the last two years, and our program establishes the routine of it. You mean in-house we're maintenance yes, issues? Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. And so as you can see, if we're looking at what's the biggest revenue, food and beverage is our biggest revenue driver next to participation. And this is why we need to really be focused about food and beverage operations, what and who is, is selling those things. As we drive forward, obviously these things are gonna fluctuate depending on you know, the season a bit, but our job is to manage it to the closest dollar. And I think we've done a pretty good job this year to minimize any type of loss. But we are really excited next year because I think this is a very obtainable goal, obtainable budget, all of the above. And as long as we can get Cornerstone open, uh, we'll be in a really good place. So that's really kind of uh, those bigger financial pieces. Operationally, we're going to have a couple changes. And one of the biggest changes kind of goes with the earlier conversations is we we have no real kind of we have a desk up front but we're not checking IDs and we've talked about this for a couple of years about how do we manage that environment to create safe locations for people to be and as an example a couple months ago there was a fight in the gym that was filmed and then there was a robbery in town with an individual who came to that facility after that and nobody wanted to participate and tensions were pretty high well, we don't really haven't had a place or a way to monitor that in a way where we can say, hey, please, we're not going to have you here. So we're going to start working on IDing everybody as they come through. We're going to get them access. We're not obviously charging, and it's not going to be a direct today. It's going to be a process. And we're going to get key fobs. So they'll have accounts. We'll have the waivers. They can scan in, utilize the facility like normal, and all the good things that go along with it. The goal would be is to ensure that we mitigate any risk, prevent anybody from being in a situation with a child that might be not desirable. And so we're going to take those steps to move forward uh, starting in the next month or so. We're also going to be putting a $150 deposit on rentals uh, for cleanup. One thing that we do is we learn that renters are not cleaning up after themselves. And the mess is extraordinary. So we have two options. We could have increased the total rental fee and penalized those who are doing what they need to, or we can penalize the ones who are not. And so we decided to add that as a uh, deposit, and if they don't get it, use it, we just give it back to them. If we have to clean up, we're going to take that money. If it exceeds that amount, then we would charge them additional to that. Now, there is a standard that we expect it to be. It's not to be like completely stick and span but trash and grease and grossness inside those things, we don't want that. That's basic maintenance and stuff. The biggest one is gonna be the sportsplex fields. So as we move forward, there's a lot of questions about you know, who's gonna have access, how we're gonna do this, and how we're gonna do that. One of the big things is we want it to be organized but not break the bank with folks. The sportsplex and the cornerstone fields, we're doing minimal rental fee for two hours to use those fields. These are for reservations, right? Yes. This is not just like I want to go out and kick the ball. This is Correct. for reservations. These right? are reservations, and it's primarily for those individuals that are doing team practices, uh, workouts, those types of things. And it's for specifically cornerstone and for uh, the sportsplex. And, and if, if I have a rec league team, 
do I do I pay these fees too, or is that part of my rec league? If you're in the Parks and Rec Rec League, we would schedule you to have practices, so you wouldn't not, you wouldn't have to because okay. we would already have that worked into and that process. It would just be anything on top of correct. That. A lot of this is travel league, so a lot of travel league teams are utilizing those fields, and not all of them are taking care of them, and so we are coming behind them during league weeks and league nights and repairing a lot of stuff, and we just need to get a handle on that. Plus, there's a liability element there that if something would happen while they're, they're paying to be part of the program and then they're practicing in a place, for us, that's a bit of a concern. Anybody who wants to use those fields during our operational hours, all they need to do is just let us know. Like, you want to kick the ball around, you want to have fun, you know you're doing something. We'll make sure you get access to those areas without any issue. It's when the training, the practices, and the workouts and all those things start happening is where we want to manage that because that's where the real damage of the fields come from. We do have additional fields that people could use if they're not happy with uh, having to be having to sign up and reserve because we still have Jail King, which has an, a softball field that will start doing a better job of maintaining. We also have a football field that's over there that's part of the park. So those are two free amenities in a park, so they have three options ultimately of what they want to use. The and we key. want to encourage usage of, I mean, Jail King's a beautiful park. We want to encourage usage Absolutely. of Jail King, so we want to keep that up. we got the goalposts up right now. We do. Now we're just looking to get the lights. Once we move the lights, move to Cornerstone, we'll get lights over at Jail King. So. And we have soccer balls that are just needing the nets put on, and we'll have those okay. over next week, so they'll okay. be able to do some soccer stuff. Cool. So. Okay. Yep. And McKee, you know, as we move forward, is going to have kind of a huge makeover. And so our fo focus isn't been the key to, hey, let's lock that down. It's more or less, hey, let's use that as we can between now and then. And uh, we're going to stay focused with kind of controlling more of the sports bikes and corners. So the other good news is we've listened to the community and many members who have asked us, hey, will you please open up on Saturday? So based on what we're able to do, we're going to be opening up on Saturdays from 8 to 12. Uh, with the understanding that when we do have events in the facility and stuff, obviously we're going to have to cancel the general usage open. But we are trying to expand those hours to give more people opportunities to use the gym. Okay. One of the things I wanted you to highlight a little bit is that we're also trying to work on additional activities like the track and field. Yes. So we had uh, more track and field participants this year than we did last year, correct? Correct. Yes. And so more of those kinds of different activities, you know, whether it's soccer, lacrosse, or, you know, track and field, or whatever, you know, we're increasing that, pickleball, all of we that, are, right? We have six youth leagues right now, six adult uh, leagues that kind of mirror each other on a two-month window. We have roughly 15 community events and programs that we are planning to put on this next fiscal year, too. Everything from holiday Christmas stuff to the Easter's, but then also non-traditional activities. Uh, there is an archery group that we're trying to work some things in. We have the golf frisbee that is uh, extremely passionate about getting some things established that we want to support. We did, uh, obviously, we, one of the things this last year was tennis. We haven't done tennis in a bit, so that's on our radar. And we're really focusing on camps for kids. The arts, the musics, the non-traditional outdoorsy stuff. And as we grow and do those things, again, everything we're doing is putting things in place to help support that. The gym divider, the ID checks, how do we control those environments so that we can maximize our space. And uh, we're really trying to grow. And so if there are things that we can do, let us know. Uh, we're trying to do bags tournaments. We talked about, oh, we have a STEM fair or a STEM event coming uh, that we're going to have at the weekend. We talked about our, uh, we have a new program that we're trying to get off the ground with scholarships and, and stuff like that that's going to start in October, and how do we get some of the book bag giveaways and these computers? We talked about doing an essay fair or an art fair where we can have people submit and we can go view those things. Just trying to get more people interested in different things. Um, we're also planning to do 10 uh, activations, which they refer to as, we're going to go into the community and have a presence, which is something we have not done a lot of in the past, I think. So we went to the junior high and we put up a table and it was a health fair to promote Parks and Rec. How do we promote it? 
Uh, we have some events planned for MSU. We got some events uh, on the downtown, some events we want to do out there. Uh, so we got a goal of 15 different activations throughout the year so that we can do a better job of promoting people, making them aware, and gathering those people to come back and say, hey, let's, let's do a candle event. Let's do a car show. Let's do this, let's do that. So we're doing a really, we're very aggressive in our community approach this next year. And I know we've exceeded our normal time of doing this, but I thought this was important. The other one thing, I'm going to say one more thing about y'all, that helping use the name image likeness opportunities. Yes. I think you had a couple of football players yeah. who came to the kids yep. and did a sort of met with them and visited with them and were inspiring to them and that sort of yep. thing, right? And you're going to try to do more of that. All the time. So every yeah. rec league that we have, we're trying to get, what well, that's again a, an activation in-house is bringing those people to to do something for those leagues to do stuff. So that was a football one for flag football where it was kind of a surprise and those, they came over and they did that. But that just demonstrates what we're trying to do to establish those relationships. Because they wanted to come to us and they came to us because of what we did at the 4th of July with them. Again, it's that partnership. And we're really into the partnership and the community support. And the community is, is loving the things that we're doing and they want to be engaged with us. So. It's really in a good direction. Okay. One thing, yes, sir. when you mentioned track, I somehow know that uh, uh, Starver High is not a really partnership with the track team over there, the ones that run the intermediate track over there. So when the, when the tennis court closed, they cut the lights off on the track team. On the track team, oh. And that's not, it don't supposed to be that way. Okay. And then the track team did go down to Florida and they came in second place. Did they? Yeah. Awesome. Well, perhaps we need to have a... I talked to Brendan. I talked to you about that. Yeah. Brendan, okay. I have think some that control over those? We could do is shared like, control over the lights of some kind? Yeah. I think that maybe, you know, I might be speaking out of scope a bit because of um, some things, but, you know, maybe looking at some type of, like, overlapping MOU for field utilization. Like, we do some things with the Christian Academy and the, the Academy in general, Starkville Academy, where we get to use their facilities and in turn they use ours uh, for programming pieces. And maybe we could expand some of those things that we've done at the high school to be more encompassing for some other things. Okay, well, I think, uh, I feel sure that they'll work with us if yeah. we just reach out and do that. Well, we supposed to have a partnership agreement. Well, we do with, with the, it? but you were talking about Christian Academy, right? And yep. and Starkville Academy, as yes. opposed to just the high school. Yeah. So we. But do you were talking about high school, right? right? With the tennis lights and the and the track. The track. Yep. So we should be able to talk with uh, Mr. Owen, Greg Owens, about that. I think they'll just take some uh, work on all parties just to come to the table and figure out what works. Okay. Well, let's put that on our to-do list. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Anything else of Mr. Dory before we let him go and get quickly to an agenda? Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you, folks. Okay. Thank Let's you, see if we can get this, sir. Uh, minutes, Mr. Latimer, we're good on those, you They're think? They're ready for consideration. Uh, consider, consider those? Okay. Um, and I think uh, Edward is going to help me remember to make an announcement about them winning, coming in second on a uh, recognition uh, at the board meeting. You want to tell it real quick, Edward, please? Yes, uh, Great. Yes, and I'll, I'll make that announcement at the board meeting. So, um, Citizens' comments, no public appearances. We've got the one public hearing, uh, which is our second public hearing on the budget and the tax millage. And have we verified that that's, that's going to go in the paper again appropriately? So the plan is after the, after the public hearing yes. to work on that notice language based okay. on the contents of that second public hearing. Okay. But all three notifications have ran before this public hearing. Right. But I was thinking about the, the next one that we've got coming up for the, uh, taking it up on the 6th. Yeah, at least in my plan is to get together Wednesday okay. morning and type that up. Okay, sounds good. We're going to vote on it in August, right? The first meeting in August? Uh, in September. Uh, September. First September. meeting in September. Yeah, yeah. September the 6th. I read his text. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, we were we were ready too to go efficient. and yeah, too efficient and couldn't couldn't fit the statute. Yeah. So. <laughs> I read his text. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, this is the resolution that um, Mr. Um, Rudy Johnson has put together with the Golden Triangle Planning and Development District. We have made it fit the city of Starkville. Apparently there is some federal funding out there for transportation that is not 
uh, previously been available for rural areas, which we are still considered rural. So he's trying to take the seven counties of the PDD and put this resolution for us to perhaps be able to tap into some of that federal funding that is now available. So this is simply a resolution created to be supportive of moving forward with that creation. So. Uh, consent if you want to or not, it's, it, it's a, it's explain, a resolution. We'll explain it to you tonight. Sure, but be happy but to. But I, yeah, we'll put it on consent. Certainly. Okay. Uh, the next one is calling for public hearings on an ordinance adopting regu regulations for small cell technology. And Mr. Latimer uh, reached out to, I believe, the Olive Branch uh, City Attorney. One of the things that I had, got, I had gotten a call on a couple of months ago was from uh, C Spire. They're looking at wanting to put these this small cell technology which is becoming very prevalent, and, but this, the unfortunate part about it is it goes, it, it's a box of some size that I really don't know, but noticeable size, and they have to go closer together. And so you find yourself, uh, I think no more than about 12 or 15 feet high, um, spaced in multiple locations. And so I want to make sure that we can have some measure of control, because what control we have is limited uh, by the feds, basically, um, on the communication side of it, but there are things that we need them to be able to, or need them to adhere to so that we don't find ourselves with a whole bunch of boxes scattered all over town and we uh, don't have any way to say yes, no, maybe to where they're wanting to put them, particularly as we redesign Main Street. We want it to look good. Mm -hmm. And so we just need to. I'm sorry? And 182. Yes, and 182 as well. So that those probably are going to be the areas that are going to be hit the first um, because they're not going to be necessarily going into the, in the residential neighborhoods. This is almost more of a commercial type of thing. So this is just calling for the first public hearing on that ordinance that uh, Mr. Latimer drafted using the um, Olive Branch model. So. And that, that draft should be in the packets yes. to give you all a head start if you yes, want to read it before it the public so, hearing. Again, this is just calling for the first public hearing. So consent, Some consent on that one? Okay. Uh, the pay raise for the current city employees, I had had individual conversations with uh, some of the aldermen and I've talked about it with the staff. I really believe that we need to stem the tide or staunch the, staunch the flow of people leaving us and I think that uh, the only way to do that is to guarantee them that we're going to be serious about our salary recommendations and I don't want to wait until our next budget year which is October 1. So I would like to see it timed as of our uh, most current pay increase and Mr. Latimer again using his statutory expertise determined that the earliest we could do it is uh, the pay period that we will come subsequent to our board meeting. So we can't do it mid, mid pay period. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that is, Lisa, what, what date is that going to be? No, I'm sorry. The 12th. It'll be the 12th. So, 12th of September? No, the 12th, 12th of August. No, 12th, that, 12th of August. That won't work. Well, the pay period starts August the 12th, but it'll have to be approved after the 16th. Mm -hmm. But remember, we can't, we can't retroactive between August 12th and August 16th. But we that can was do the, issue. the 16th going forward, the 17th going forward. We can forward. do the 17th going forward. So, yeah. Yeah. so we can do it mid pay period. But only going forward. Right. Yeah. That's right. So it'd be the 17th going yeah. forward. Yeah. So anyway, whatever that calculation ends up being. But that's that was the goal. I know you wanted to do it a number of months ago, but we just didn't, you know. So now we need to do it. <laughs> Consent, let them take it off. All right. <laughs> That'll work. Okay. Let's do it. He's gonna ask us a lot. Uh, uh, well and, and I think that from my conversations, again, I think I think people acknowledge and understand that we need to we need to pay our people and we need to be competitive and we're finding ourselves in a position well, of... To, to, to that end, yes, we need to modify this a little bit to say instead of timed as of the next occurring pay period... Um, you want to say August the 17th? August 17th. Okay, I'm fine with that. Lisa, can you make that modification? Okay. I'll change that to the 50 August. Okay, which means it just need a little bit of tweaking in terms of running the numbers, right? Yes. Okay. We've got good people working We do. I believe that. I believe that. Uh, we have no agenda items for the airport. Uh, Daniel, we have uh, a couple of uh, final plats, I think. And, yeah, uh, the, the first one for Pine Lake is just an aggregation of two commercial lots and the one for their future expansion. Okay, and now. Uh, approved by development by DRC. There you and go. And it goes straight to the board. All the does not need to play in so. Okay, so, and those are usually, there are no controversy whatsoever. No controversy. So, consent. consent for that. Mm -hmm. And then the next one? The next one is the same thing, but it's a residential lot in the summit portion of the Greenbrier subdivision. And uh, it's gone through DRC, got approval, then looked at, so there's no okay. controversy. Consent for that one? 
Okay, and then a preliminary plat approval. This one is at the corner of Scales and Louisville. They previously had a preliminary plat approval that has since expired, and they've come back with a new plan to make four lots and go through PNC and was unanimously recommended. Unanimously? Okay, all right, consider Percent. that. Okay. Um, and then the special event request, this is the Starkville Area Arts Council, our um, Cotton District Arts Festival. So. Cotton District Arts Festival, everything's pretty the same as last year. Okay. Okay. Consent. 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 So does that look like it's going to be yeah, the fall festival? Okay. Yes, going uh, October the, going oh, going forward. I, now, I don't know about that. I don't, uh, I don't know. For the time being, yes, they, they, they're trying to see if this is going to work out in the long run, so they're going to keep it. Okay. Okay. Um, under engineering, we have authorization to advertise for proposals for the engineering design services for Northside Drive drainage improvements. That we've sort of Cody sort of determined that that is something that's a little bit more than we want to do in house, right? Yeah, from the time perspective, I think we can get that set of plans a lot more efficient. sooner than sooner than later. So, so. Just a request, uh, right? Proposal, so. so, all right. Good Thank set. you. And and what's your? I didn't I haven't read the cover sheet. What's your date for submissions on those? I was going to try to have those. I believe it's far, um, two weeks from today, which would allow us, if we want to accept the proposals, to put them in the next agenda. Good. Okay. So, Go ahead. Right. Thank you. And this um, is one of those things that we've gotten some funding for yes. the state. Yes. Um, um, Ms. Um, Representative Taylor got us two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is wonderful. Uh, I think the original um, estimate by Ed, by Edward when he was in that role was two two fifty. It was right in that ballpark. Too, yeah. Twenty five. Yeah. Year. So, okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, we had so, funded some, we had um, budgeted some of it too. We, we had we had budgeted it. Yeah, I don't folks got this, so you know, whatever we use, yeah. we just make sure we make sure we make it beautiful and do the best we can with it, you know. Yeah, well, and hopefully so it will come in. Maybe some of those prices will start to come down and it'll come in and we won't have to tap into in beyond that 250 too much. So, okay, claim stock it will skip over. We have July financials. Anything extraordinary about those? It's hard that we need to know consent for those. Percent. Okay, and then the budget amendments, um, budget chair, have you looked at those? Yeah. Any issues with those? Yeah. Okay, consent. just normal consent. stuff, consent for that. And authorization to advertise for source of supply, so percent. consent for that. HR, Mr. Ashford, anything about this and this, let's have a little bit on, there you are, sorry, wrong, wrong <laughs> room top, uh, a little bit about this uh, public safety premium pay program. So. Yes, we were awarded some uh, some funds from the state. It's called the Public Safety Premium Pay, and so in order for the fire protection and police officers to be able to do it, the board would have to approve uh, the process. And so what it is, they would receive a thousand dollars for certain. This is a statewide. This program. is a statewide program, and so they would receive a thousand dollars for being okay. first responders. All right. Okay. 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 They would be certified. Did, did I hear you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's all certified. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then we have uh, two deputy court clerks to hire. Percent. I'll work on the pronunciation later. Um, Ms. Ewing is a part-time radio operator dispatch Percent. authorization to hire and hiring Brandon Taylor as part-time customer service rep for Percent. utilities. Consent for that one. And then Michelle working in a dual position as the administrative assistant with, for the airport and then a receptionist at the front desk. And Michelle, I can say, is extraordinary at customer service. She is always a, a welcome face, so that'll be a real positive. Consent. All right, thank you. All right, under parks, we have a trailer that will allow us to, Mr. Brandon, what, what is that trailer gonna allow us to do? Is uh, load stuff and carry stuff? And yeah, absolutely, Liz. We're gonna be using some of the uh, organic materials and stuff. So we originally submitted it back in April, and uh, I tried to put some things on the, on the docket. So this is just updating it so that it actually is uh, about four times about it. The ashes are going from one ton to a ten ton, so we can transport more rock, dirt, and things like that. Around so, around the okay. Is this a capital purchase or an operations a capital yeah, purchase? Okay. Okay. Consider that. Okay. All righty. All right. Police department. We have grants, grants, and grants. <laughs> Three sets of grants. Consent. All right, consent for those? Consent. All right, that works. And 100% reimbursable, that's that's wonderful. Uh, sanitation department, we have a lease purchase for a printer. Consent. With, uh, Mr. Latimer, you worked through that? It's ready to go, okay. yes right. ma'am. All right, consent, consent for that one. And then lowest bid for um, financing, what do we got here? Yeah. Lease purchase of the knuckle bone loader, that's right. Okay, consent. Right. consent for that one. Glad to have that second knuckle boom coming in. Uh, work order under utilities. 
Mr. Uh, Kemp, anything you wish to share with about any of that? These are lights for Cornerstone and then lights for Rock Hill Road. Um, the vice mayor is aware of the Rock Hill Road. We're dividing it into two different phases. One goes up to 182 and the other one will then go from 180, uh, I'm sorry, 82. 82 up to um, the city limits. To the limits, okay. So, consent, consent for those? All right. And, then, uh, and the part of the reason for that, guys, is th that it's on here is that it's not us doing it from start with utilities. It's because it's a four county thing. Four county. So we rely right. on them. Right. Uh, water division, this is a surplus and a purchase. Mr. Consent. Kim, consent for that. And then task order for seven powers. We finally got that one rolling, Mr. Latimer. Yeah, and Edward and I are still tweaking the boilerplate on the exhibit, so let's leave that off consent. I think it'll okay. be cleared up by Tuesday. By Tuesday. And we can add okay. it on. Okay. All right. And then purchasing six inch and four inch water meter set up for central pipe. Uh, okay. Consent. Consent for that. All right. All right, guys. Great. Thank you so much, Thanks everybody. Much. Appreciate y'all work, working through all the presentations, but I thought they were important for us to, for us to have. So, okay, thank hope you. everyone has a great weekend, and we will uh, see you on Tuesday. All Thanks, right. Guys. Thank you. Have all a right. good one.